Thank you very much, Luis Felipe. Um, good morning, colleague. Uh, today, my presentation will be on the uh, revenue implication of the recent, you know, OECD and G20 tax reform introducing uh, a minimum global uh, effective tax rate. So I will look at the, the impact of that uh, very important reform on international taxation for, for, for African countries. I, I have structured my, my presentation around this, this point. I will, I will provide, I will start with some background elements on the, the reform. And then I will look at the, the structure, the content of the, of the reform. And after that, some critics and concern have been raised about the reform. I will, I will mention some of them. And then I will, uh, I will uh, present my empirical strategy to, to evaluate the likely impact of, of that reform on, on, on tax collection for, for African economies. And finally, I will, I will you know, derive some um, implication, policy implication uh, uh, for, 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 for policy makers in, in the continent. Uh, as you may know, um, in, in October 2021, uh, one 137 uh, out of 141 jurisdiction of the OECD and G20, uh, G G20 uh, jurisdiction engage in uh, discussion for reforming uh, the international tax rule agreed on a solution that we call a two-pillar solution for addressing you know, the, the, the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of economies. Uh, so that agreement uh, it could be structured like, like, like this. The agreement, agreement has two pillars, okay? The first pillar is try to, to grant, to give taxing rights to the countries that we call the market countries, uh, which are the countries where multinational enterprises uh, have customers without having a physical presence in, in these countries. So the pillar one give a taxing right to, to, to these countries, these market countries. And uh, uh, under this pillar one, you have three components. My focus here is on pillar two, so I will develop more, I will elaborate more on, on pillar two. So pillar two introduce a minimum effective tax rate on, on multinational enterprises uh, that meet the 750 or uh, annual annual uh, global uh, uh, revenue so under uh, the pillar 2 pillar 2 has three uh, uh, component okay if the component uh, that component includes the income inclusion rule and the under tax payment rule and finally uh, what we call the subject to tax rule let me say some uh, few words on, on each of these uh, uh, components of uh, of pillar 2 the income inclusion rule suggests that um, the, uh, the tax jurisdiction of a, um, a, parent, uh, uh, a parent company of a for a multinational that subsidiaries has not meet at least 15% uh, as the effective tax rate will charge a top-up tax to the uh, parent uh, company side that the the uh, global effective minimum tax rate of the group will be at least 15%. So that's the, 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 the substance of the uh, income inclusion rule. But now the under tax payment rule suggests that if the uh, tax jurisdiction of the parent company fail to charge the top up tax, and uh, if uh, the parent uh, company, the, the parent company uh, has a, an effective tax rate under 15%, in that case, the tax jurisdiction of uh, where the subsidiaries are located will be allowed to, to, ta to, to, to charge a top-up tax such that you know, the, the uh, effective tax rate of the group will be at least 15%. And finally, you have what we call the subject to tax rate, ta the subject to tax rule, which is related to tax treaties between countries. So under this, um, this rule, um, the source countries for international payment like dividend royalties will be allowed to charge a top-up tax to, to, you know, to bring the effective tax rate at 15% at least. 
And the uh, VTAX, uh, VTAX rate for the subject to task role is, is 9%. Now, uh, the, the reform has, has received some, some critics and, and concern, uh, uh, especially for, for the Pillar 2. And the, the some, most of the critics are articulated and, uh, uh, around these three points. Uh, the, the first one is the priority given to, you know, to headquarter countries to charge the, 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 the top-up tax uh, uh, under the in income inclusion rule as I, 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 I develop. Uh, 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 now, um, that means that you know, developed countries where most of the multinational enterprises are headquartered will be, you know, vo those who will benefit from from the reform. So that's one of the critic that uh, the, the, the reform receive. And then uh, the, the rates and the scope of pillar two has also received critics and. Um, indicating that the, the rate of 15% is too low. Remember that the United States was suggesting 21%, while ATAF, African Tax Administration, was, was proposing, you know, uh, um, 20%. So they think that since most of the African countries and developing countries have, you know, standard corporate tax rate higher than, you know, 15%, there is a risk that you will have, you know, this kind of race to the bottom in. in with that 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 rate, and the you know the threshold for for the pillar two is too you know is too high to to bring on board many multinational. It's a uh, it's a speed that our own 100 you know multinational will be covered by by uh, the the, uh, the pillar two you know the the, the threshold of one uh, 750. So one of the suggestions was to bring down, to reduce that threshold side that will take into account into the tax net, most of the large taxpayer in, in African countries. And finally, the final point is about the legitimacy of OECD. You know, OECD is, um, a, a, a include uh, mass, most of the developed countries and uh, the developing countries are, are not uh, really member of that organization. So the question is whether uh, if OECD is leading this kind of reform, the voice of uh, developing countries will be t t t t taken uh, into, into account. So these are the, uh, the, the major uh, critics about the, the reform. And uh, le let's let's look at now how the reform could you know uh, affect tax collection in in in, in African countries. Uh, clearly, I have identified two transmission channels. Uh, the reform will you know discourage uh, granting tax incentive for you know for countries because if you grant tax incentive, the parent country, another country will collect you know the tax that you foregone uh, in tax uh, incentive. So there is no in safety for you to grant tax incentive to multinational enterprises. Um, the second channel will be, you know, the, the reduction in profit shifting, you know, because even if you shift profit, you will be subjected to, 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 to the same tax burden in, in the country where you are transferring uh, 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 the, 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 the profit, the tax base. Uh, now let's uh, look at very quickly the imaging literature on, on the revenue, the evaluation of the revenue or uh, impact of a global minimum tax. For now, we have just one or two papers. Uh, Baraki and, and colleague uh, have tried to, you know, to stimulate what could be the, 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 the impact of the reform for, for, for developed countries, uh, uh, keeping in mind that the reform, the implementation of the reform will start next year, uh, hopefully. Um, they, they think that the reform could, you know, uh, um, the gain for, for uh, the reform will be 64 billion euro for uh, European countries, while for United States, it's estimated that the United States could, could gain uh, 50, uh, 57 billion uh, euro. But if you look at the gain for developing countries, it's relatively, relatively small. Uh, 1.5 billion for, for Brazil. And uh, that estimate excludes what they call the cave outs, the substance cave outs, uh, you know, that exclude from the tax based calculation, uh, 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 payroll, and, uh, and asset. If you take these un into account, these uh, gain will significantly uh, uh, reduce. The OECD has also estimated, you know, the, the global gain of the reform. 
at one, 150 billion, but at country level, we don't have, uh, you know, estimate for, for now. That, uh, that this gap that we try to, to fill with this paper, and uh, our methodology, uh, we, we try to, uh, to estimate uh, a, a regression discontinuity design where uh, we will consider the threshold 15 percent as the you know the cutoff uh, the, the the cutoff rate, and then uh, the countries that will be higher uh, that will have an effective uh, tax rate uh, corporate tax rate higher than 15 percent will be considered as the treatment group, while those who are under which are under uh, the, the 15 percent rate are the uh, control control group. We, uh, so for those who are familiar with uh, this methodology, the assignment variable is effective corporate income tax rate and, and uh, the outcome variable clearly is the tax collection. Uh, data, we, we collect uh, tax expenditure data from the recent global tax expenditure database uh, 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 built by the Conseil on Economic Policy and the German Development Institute and uh, uh, corporate income tax revenue are collected from ICTD and, um, and IMF. Uh, I will not spend uh, mo most time here, and uh, yeah. The result, very quickly, uh, uh, I, I find that the, the likely impact of the, of the reform on tax collection I is not statistically significant at the conventional statistic, uh, statistic uh, significance level, so you know, you know and uh, um, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, again, uh, the same, the same result. I, 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 I don't find a, a significant a impact of the of the reform when I consider total tax revenue and when I consider uh, an alternative uh, uh, threshold for the minimum uh, tax tax rate. Um, now, the the conclusion and the policy implication of the paper. Uh, basically, we try to contribute to the debate on the on the revenue uh, implication of the uh, of the global minimum uh, corporate tax rate for African economies, and uh, for that we have uh, estimate a regression discontinuity design to to base on the history of uh, effective corporate tax rate on, on tax collection, and the main finding of the, the paper uh, indicate that you know, the implementation of a global minimum uh, tax rate is likely to end up with no gains for, for in terms of tax, collect tax revenue mobilization for, for African countries. And these results are aligned with the findings from Jacobs and, and Mark Ratti. Um, but let, let, let's be clear, the, the, these results do not necessarily mean that, you know, the idea of introducing uh, introducing uh, a minimum uh, corporate tax rate, a, minim a global minimum corporate tax rate is, is bad. What the results, the finding are suggesting is that to, you know, to call uh, the, the, the stakeholders, the inclusive framework members to, to reconsider the roles, okay, of the reform side that to make sure that it will benefit developing country, African countries, uh, and, and, and uh, that approach will, you know, facilitate the acceptability, the political acceptability and, and, and the implementation of, of the reform in, in African countries. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tedu. Um, please keep your questions until the discussion se uh, session uh, at the end. So Katia Toledo will present um, a study of the fiscal reform in Peru looking at the base erosion and tax and um, profit shifting um, effects. Thank you.
everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to present this paper who has been worked with my co-author, Alfredo Alvarado. Um, at this point of the conference, all of us understand and know the importance, the relevant to raise tax revenue, mainly to finance uh, sustainable development. Uh, but something that uh, has to be highlighted is that these tax revenue are particularly important for lack countries. Uh, however, um, that the loss, the, the, the losses related to this kind of revenue are especially large in developing countries as uh, lack. Uh, so to counteract these kind of problems, uh, countries introduce into their, into their laws transfer pricing rules, um, which is the case of Peru. But uh, unfortunately, or at the same time, it could be possible that firms could invest in tax planning or generally speaking consultancy services to reduce their tax payments. So uh, in this context, um, in this context we assess, we wanted we wanted to assess to evaluate the transfer pricing reform that was implemented in 2017 in Peru which mainly was characteris characteris is, is about to uh, the increase of reporting requirements, uh, a, a high investment in better keep, uh, human capital, and the introduction of a specific rules for intra-group services. Uh, about the uh, scope of this transfer pricing reform in Peru, um, the firms which are under the, this treatment are those with total revenue greater than 2,300 UIT. UIT is the uh, acronym of tax unit in, in Peru. And uh, the firms with control transactions uh, greater than uh, 400 UIT. Control transactions, I mean transactions of operations performing between related parties, but also with tax havens. Um, but as a, third ther as a third point, I, I wanted to, to point that, that there are some firms which total revenues greater than this amount, 2,300 UITs, but not necessarily, or with contract transactions less than uh, 400 UIT. So this is important because in our um, uh, empirical strategy, we will uh, look at this. So mainly the research question that we put under the table as what was the effect of this reform uh, on our ad outcome and our outcome is tax payments at the fear level. And uh, given that uh, the key role of mm, consultant consulting firms, uh, we also ask ourselves what role did the, the uh, did that consulting firms play in the TP reform? Maybe. Okay, so the variables that we built uh, are mainly the total revenues, uh, total annual uh, uh, revenues, which is the sum of sales, financial income, and other incomes. That control taxation, as I, I said, is the sum of operation carry or performance between related parties in with uh, tax havens. Um, something important to highlight. Some something important to highlight here is that ideally, we have, uh, we should have to 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 see the the flow of this operation throughout all the year, 
but unfortunately uh, the database that we use um, does not give us this detail. So uh, we look or we show, we use uh, the stock of these operations at the end of the year. Uh, but to, over so to overcome this issue, we uh, study um, three samples of, of firms, like a three, three uh, scenarios. The first firms with control taxation, no matter the amount. Second one, uh, firms with and uh, or without control transactions. And finally, uh, a third plot, a third scenario, uh, which are firms with control taxation um, greater than 400 UIT, which is uh, strictly the application of the reform. So we build also a, a, a variable about consultancy and expenditure or uh, on consultancy services, and the income tax, the tax payment done by the firms. And for all, all, all of these, we use a GR a enterprises, uh, enterprises survey made in Peru. So uh, we explode that we have um, a running variable, which is our total revenue, and we explode that, we explode that, and you using a regression discontinuity design. So mainly, uh, or generally speaking, um, through this methodology, we um, uh, calculate the local average effect of the treatment, I mean the, um, the reform, calculating the difference between um, our outcome, the, the outcome of the firms under the reform um, and the firms, the outcome of the firms which are not under the reform. Uh, our one year variable is, as I said, uh, the total annual revenues and the, cut the cutoff point is this amount of 2,300 UIT. Uh, something that is key uh, when we apply uh, this kind of design, research design, is to make sure that there is no manipulation uh, in the running variable. I mean that firms uh, couldn't anticipate the, the value of the cutoff point. And as we can see, there's not uh, evidence of some anticipation of that. And moving on the result, I, I, I always, I, I like graphs, so <laughs> graphs, so I always start showing these RG plots. So um, in, the, uh, in the horizontal axis, we can see the the fear um, revenues expressed in Peruvian soles centered at zero, which it means that this point zero is uh, it's equals to 2,300 UIT. Okay, uh, this is the y-axis is our the value of our outcome tax payment, and this line is our cutoff point. Okay, so as we can see firms to the le to the right of the cut cutoff point are the, fir are the firms which are not under the reform. And uh, the other sites are under the reform, uh, under the treatment. So um, we draw the, uh, the, the, the average effect around our cutoff in all of the three scenarios that we assess. And as can we see, there is a, there is a clear discontinuity, okay? That um, may uh, suggest some evidence about uh, a positive effect of this reform. So let's see the value of our coefficient. 
And in this table, um, we have the value of our beta. Uh, but the string. I think it's okay without my name. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, seeing this table, we can see the value of our beta, our estimator, in the three of our samples. Uh, I would like to focus in the um, in the value in the values in highlighted in, in yellow because these are related uh, to the optimal uh, bandwidth. So we see that for all of the three samples, the estimator is not only positive, but also significant, which means that there was a, um, a positive effect of this reform on tax payment of the firms. Um, in the year, uh -huh, thank you. In the year uh, under treatment, 2017. So we look one year after, and surprisingly, <laughs> the effect is negative. Uh, so given that, we uh, ask ourselves what happened. Maybe um, the the. the the service, the consulting services, high rates uh, from um, consultants and firms can explain this, this kind of result. Uh, but uh, when we see, when we look at the effects of the reform on the expenditure on consultancy services, we don't find like a Mm, strong, uh, we don't find significant eff 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 effects. Uh, so some of the next steps that we we will we will do is first to find out to find out what happened between these years, given that as uh, as some of the literature uh, says that. Granting more information or in discretion to the tax authority will not necessarily, necessarily result in higher tax compliance. Uh, some concluded remarks are that this reform had a positive effect on tax payments. Firms affected, indeed, firms uh, affected by that intervention paid more taxes on average on 2017. Um, we wanted to assess uh, a potential channel of tax avoidance with respect to consultancy service, but uh, fortunately we didn't find um, con concluding effects. And finally, uh, we think that more research should be done to disentangle the role of this tax consultants and firms in abusive PPP practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katia. Uh, Vincent Sonville, he will present on uh, behavioral changes in VAT co compliance using a Tanzanian uh, lottery uh, experiment. Floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. So my name is Vincent or Vincent Somville from the Norwegian School of Economics. And uh, what I'm presenting today is a, a project, part of a project we're doing uh, together with some colleagues from Norway and some colleagues from the research department at the Tanzania Revenue Authority, the TRA. The project is about VAT compliance. So as you know, VAT is a potentially important source of revenue. Uh, but the revenues from, from the VAT are actually very low in, in Tanzania and also in, in neighboring countries, much lower than they could be in principle. So the situation is in, in Tanzania, the, but what normally happens is that when you go to a business, think about like business to customer transactions, you go to a business, you buy something, uh, some you will get a receipt, 
in which case the transaction is recorded and VAT can be collected. Sometimes you don't, uh, often you don't. Uh, but if you ask for it, if you actively ask for a receipt when you buy something, then normally you will get it. Businesses know that they have the obligation to give a receipt when the customer asks, so you will normally get this receipt. So the idea in this project, and it's an idea that the, the TRA has been pushing for some years, is to try to introduce a, li a receipt lottery to push customers to ask for receipts when they make a purchase and try to get people into this habit of asking for receipts when you buy something. Because if they do that, then the transaction are recorded and the tax can be collected. And of course, if they do that, then the businesses will also start asking for receipts from their suppliers because then they can also get refunds and, and then the whole VAT chain can, can work. That's the idea. It's not a new idea. So there, is, there are cases, for example, in Brazil or in China that have been well documented, but also in other countries. Um, but we don't know of any other lottery like this. Or there have been some trials in Rwanda, but we don't know of any like well-functioning lotteries like this one in, in African countries. But if you know of some, please let me know. OK, so the lottery that, that we're trying here, so every TRA receipt, every valid receipt is a lottery ticket. And in this lottery, there's these receipts are very easy to check. So there's always a QR code. You can scan it with your phone, and then you get, uh, TRA will tell you if this is a valid receipt or not. And if it's not, you can also immediately report it to the, to the TRA. Uh, so this, in Tanzania, you have around 130,000 uh, businesses. So, and, and we distinguish two types of businesses. There are the VAT registered businesses. That's like one third of all the companies and they're supposed to collect the VAT. But then you have a big group of, comp of businesses that are also formal, they're registered, but they're below a certain threshold. They don't have, they're not VAT registered, they don't have to collect the VAT, but they have the obligation to print receipts. And this is very important for the tax authority because it's only if they start printing receipts that the tax authority can get a good idea of how large they actually are and whether they should eventually uh, fall into the VAT registered uh, system. So that second part is also, so if those guys start printing receipts, that will not increase the, the revenues immediately, but it's very important to increase the VAT revenues in the longer term. Uh, the lottery has four weekly prices of around, uh, of exactly 250,000 shillings. So that's $300 in PPP, if you believe those numbers. Uh, and there is one bigger monthly price in addition of a million shillings or around 1,200 uh, US dollars in PPP. This lottery was introduced in Tegeta. Uh, that, so that is one of the 32 tax regions of, Tan of Tanzania. Uh, so they're different from the administrative regions, just like uh, tax region. And they've been, they start it started in July 2022. So what I will show you today is the effects that we see in the first month of the lottery. We just got the data a couple of weeks ago, so that's why I didn't have a paper to share with you. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's been heavily advertised, and in survey we see that people really know about it, they know it's happening, so it was advertised on social media, there were uh, cars driving along the streets with loudspeakers to tell about it. This is a copy of the poster that were also uh, placated a bit around the, around the region, saying that you know, if you ask for a valid EFD receipt, and you can get money, and then they explain how this lottery is working. These are example. This is the launch of the lottery by the TRA in in, uh, in the region, and this is an example of uh, one. This woman just won the lottery, so she went to the local TRA office, got uh, got her money and got a T-shirt, and then it was also advertised on social media. So they make a, a lot of effort to publicize the lottery and also show that it, it's actually happening. Now, how are we going to measure the effects of this lottery on tax revenues? We're using the data from the electronic fiscal devices. So these devices that businesses use when they make a, or should use when they make a transaction. Uh, so we have uh, data about all the transactions that are done during this period and also before the, the introduction of the lottery for all the businesses of Tanzania. So this does not include the large taxpayers, which are a different group. It does not include uh, Zanzibar because Zanzibar has its own VAT system with like different rate and different. So it's just mainland Tanzania, not, not the large taxpayers. And we will be looking at, uh, we want to compare the regions that don't have the lottery with the region that has the lottery. And we want to know how these outcomes evolved in all those regions before and after the introduction of the lottery. The outcomes that we are looking at are the number of receipts that every business is printing, the sales of those businesses, the VAT that they collected, and whether they're 
are above the registration threshold for those that are not registered for the VAT? Are we pushing some to above the threshold? Um, well, technical details, we do this, so this it's a difference in difference, even study estimator. Uh, I'll just show you for those, for those who want to know. But I will show you graphically the, the results. So this is showing you, for example, among the VAT registered firms, the average number of receipts that they print every month since January 21. So we, we see the, this uh, until uh, of last month, October. And the black line here is the introduction of the lottery. The blue dot is the estimated effect, the estimated difference between the region that has the lottery compared to the regions that don't have a lottery. This blue dot is always very close to zero and it doesn't seem to increase after the lottery is introduced. If the lottery had a large effect on printing of receipts, we should see those blue dots being much higher than where they are now. So what we conclude here is that this lottery is not having any effect on the average number of receipts that the businesses are, are printing. It also doesn't have any average effect on the sales. It doesn't have any effect on the VAT that they collect. And we have the same picture if we look at the non-registered uh, businesses. No effect on receipts printed, no effect on sales, no effect on the probability that they move above the registration threshold for the VAT. So this is in, in quite stark contrast with the experiences of Brazil or China or other countries. It didn't seem to work at all. So I presented this to the TRA and the local officers in charge of the lottery a few weeks ago in Dar es Salaam. They didn't believe it. They told me, Vincent, something is wrong. I don't know what you did with your statistics, but no, it's working. People know about it. People ask for receipts. Something is wrong. Okay. So what, what, what else did we do? We also did data collection in the region all the during the lottery. So in July, August, September, uh, we've been just sending teams of enumerators. They stop people in the street, and then they simply ask, have you bought something today? Uh, did you get a receipt? Can I see your receipt? And then asking, you know, some questions to check if there is any change in the in how people actually behave in that region. So there we have a sample of about 1,200 customers, and it this this survey it allows you us to reconstruct, if you want, the the compliance process. We stop these people. Did you buy? Did you make buy something? <laughs> yes. If you bought something, do you have a receipt? And 71% don't have a receipt but 29% have a receipt. If you have a receipt, did you get it automatically from the business or did you have to ask for it? And, that, and then if you, and you know, given that you have a receipt, is it a valid receipt or is it a fake receipt? That doesn't count. That's what we want to measure, all those different steps with that survey. What we found there in the survey is that what actually happened is that the proportion of businesses who automatically give a receipt without being asked for one, that goes down. So when the lottery was introduced, we had more than 20% of the businesses were automatically giving a receipt without being asked. And when the lottery in is introduced, this proportion goes down to 15%. So we think that the way the businesses reacted to the introduction of the lottery is by you know, stepping back and not giving a receipt unless they are asked. So that's a negative effect on printing of receipt. In fact, they gave less valid receipts, but they give more fake receipts. Another way they reacted is by printing receipts, but they're not true theory receipts. On the customer side, it worked. My colleagues from TRA were correct. The proportion of people who ask for a receipt more than triples. People really did ask for receipts, but given that they're less likely to give, be given one automatically, those two effects are compensating each other. And when they ask, they're more likely to get a true TRA receipt, but they're also more likely to get a fake receipt. So it looks like businesses reacted in two ways. One, less likely to give a receipt when I'm not asked. Another one, even if I'm asked, more likely to give a fake one. So overall, also in the survey, we don't find large effects on, on VAT compliance or the printing of receipts. Always around 22, 24. And these numbers have value in themselves. It's, it's not easy to measure VAT compliance. In that region, we estimate that like 20, 24% of the transactions are actually recorded. And you know, three-fourths of them are 
under the table. Okay, conclusion. Uh, <coughs> despite uh, the hypothesis and despite the experience of other countries, in the first months at least, we don't see any large effect on sales, receipts, VAT formalization uh, on average. But this like, administrative data is like hiding some, something happened. You, you cannot stop at the administrative data. When we go into the survey data, we see that in fact thing that things have changed. People are more likely to ask for receipt, but businesses reacted in a way that compensate the, this lottery effect. So it's not clear. Uh, in fact, the lottery could even have negative effects because if you stop the lottery now, maybe businesses will keep not giving out receipts automatically like they used to. It could have even a negative effect, who knows. Um, so I wanted to present this for like, two main reasons. Why? One, I thought it was nice to emphasize the importance of first-hand on-the-ground investigations in, in addition to using administ administrative data. Uh, the other one is, I think it's a good example of research feeding into policy because now, of course, we're discussing this with the TRA, trying to change the lottery to push people, yeah, to change it in a way that it can actually work. And uh, it's the end of the story. So. Let's see what happens in the in the forthcoming months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Um, after these three very nice uh, empirical papers, we are going to go now to close with a with a theoretical paper on uh, remittance stacks in an overlapping generations model for Philippines. John John Paolo Rivera. John Paolo, the floor is yours. After that, we will open for questions for the four papers. Hello. Okay, good afternoon. Is it already af is it already noon? Good afternoon everyone. Buenas tardes, señor. And I would be presenting a working research, no? Titled The Macroeconomic and Welfare Impacts of a Theoretical Remittance Tax on the Highly Skilled Labor in the Philippines. And I implemented an overlapping generations model to estimate the impact of this theoretical tax on, if, if I may stay here? Okay, so I would like to give you a brief background of why this study has been done. Okay. Number one, there is a high prevalence of temporary labor migration in the Philippines that originated in the 1970s when the Middle Eastern economies have actually started on their developmental projects that required workers. Okay. And in the 1970s, what started as a temporary solution to the rising unemployment in the Philippines during that time has become somewhat permanent as the years go by, and we now call it this temporary labor migration in the country. However, th the, this incidence of mi labor migration in the Philippines has actually resulted to certain benefits. And one of them is the remittance inflow to the Philippines that it has continuously sustained its increasing trend, of course, with dips during the pandemic because of the border closure that constrained labor migrants from the Philippines to enter the different economies in Europe, in the, in, in the Americas, in the Middle East, and so on. But as far as the Philippine economy is concerned, we have become reliant on the remittances as a tool in order to stabilize the economy 
because of the dollar inflows that comes to the country from what we call our overseas migrant workers. However, during the pandemic, something happened. Okay? There was a huge demand for Filipino professionals, particularly medical workers, nurses, and doctors. They're highly in demand in many developed economies that prompted government to actually stop the, the outflow of our professionals because it's a pandemic and the domestic economy requires such skilled workers. And during the pandemic in the Philippines, the discussion about taxing skilled migrant workers again emanated from this situation that, hey, we have been producing many medical workers, but then there's a social cost. The social cost of labor migration has been emphasized during the pandemic. Other than that, this issue has been compounded by the growing external debt of the Philippines by huge borrowings in order to manage the, the pandemic. Combined, combining this exodus and the rising external debt, government now is considering that how can we able to pay for this huge debt when we have already exhausted a lot of revenue generating activities by government. That's why the topic of brain drain tax has again emerged. And according to literature, no, the terminology for this one is the Baguati tax proposed no, to levy an exit tax no, upon the exit of workers. But then in this study, I qualify workers to be the highly skilled professionals okay, to compensate the loss of highly skilled manpower in the sending economy, which is the Philippines in this case. And the Baguati tax specifically suggested a surtax levied by the worker receiving developed economy to benefit the worker sending economy. So it's basically somebody has to shoulder the social cost to internalize the cost of migration and its impact to the sending economy. However, there have been criticisms. Most of them are criticisms as far as the Philippine society is concerned because it puts the burden, okay, it puts the burden on the highly skilled worker. There are now questions of fairness, equity, because why will you tax me? I was the one who actually did the uh, studies. No? I did study, I did train, and then I will have to shoulder this social cost. No? And the literature is also arguing that brain drain tax may exacerbate income inequality in the sending economy. And while there are many positive effects mentioned in the literature, weighing them, weighing the cost and the benefits, it's the cost that actually is much heavier in societal discussion. No? And historically speaking, if I may share, no, the Philippines has actually technically no, adopted some form of a brain drain tax. However, okay, it did not fully materialize because of the heavy criticisms from the different groups of professional workers. Therefore, no, this study has been motivated by the extensive discussion, the failure for it to transpire in the local economy. That's why there is no way for us to really understand the impacts of imposing such tax because it was never really implemented fully in the first place. So one of the resort that we did is to implement a theoretical model using the overlapping generations model in order to paint a picture of if ever this brain drain tax would really be implemented, what would be its impact, particularly on the macro economy? Okay, and this will allow us to do two things. Number one, it's to evaluate whether the imposition of this brain drain tax promotes economic growth and development in the country. And we would also be able to validate the critics on the brain drain tax in the Philippine context. Okay? So in this research, uh, we asked the question, how can this theoretical brain drain tax affect the macroeconomy and household welfare? And the sub-questions would be, is it time for a developing country like the Philippines to implement such tax? 
and under what conditions will this brain drain tax work and not work? Okay, of course, in the Philippine context. Okay, and the objectives of this study is to develop this overlapping generations model for the Philippines. However, this is also subject to certain flexibilities that other economies may want to make adjustments so that the model will also fit their own domestic situation. And through a specific methodology, we will assess this theoretical OLG model you know, using calibration to determine how this brain drain tax affects the paths of steady state, aggregate income, capital accumulation, and consumption. Okay. And in the light and persistence of labor migration in the Philippines, and the lessons we have learned from the pandemic, is it really high time okay, to implement such thing? Okay. And as part of some literature review, okay, because the situation of temporary labor migration is unique for different economies, in the Philippines, the root cause of temporary labor migration is two-pronged. Number one are the pull and push factors of migration. And to summarize that, it's actually the wage differential that exists between the Philippines as a developing economy and many developed countries with high demand for skilled workers coming from the Philippines. And there is also this culture of migration among Philippine or Filipino households. What is this culture of migration? For a certain household, if I see somebody very successful in the labor migration, in labor migration, I would tend to follow the footstep, the path. Ah, this worker studied this degree, have this degree. Okay? I would also take higher education with the goal of also migrating in the future. And that has been prevalent in many households because of the promise the promise that temporary labor migration can actually bring in more remittances for dependent households. Okay? And it's also part of the recovering of the investment in education through labor migration and remittances. Higher education in the Philippines is quite unique because bulk of it is privately financed with some portion that is publicly financed. Okay? And because I'm the one who technically shouldered the cost of my education, labor migration is a key for me to be able to recover my investment in education. And also we have the economic impacts of labor migration and remittances as a stabilizing factor for the macro economy. Okay. And second is the managing temporary labor migration through a brain drain tax, wherein the brain drain tax compensates for human capital losses. If somebody is shouldering the, the cost. No? internalizing the cost of migration. But then also, literature is arguing that brain drain tax can also be a source of inequality due to the differences in, in the impact of taxes on the sending economy, on those who will be left behind, and those who would be leaving the domestic economy. So briefly, briefly, we implemented an overlapping generations model wherein we have a representative utility function with habit formation and the traditional Cub Douglas production function following the standard assumptions of Diamond who developed this overlapping generations model. And I believe the slides or the paper would be made available to everyone, so I would just leave the details of the assumptions that were used in the utility and production functions. So we have here the baseline, the different assumptions used. I will just leave that to you. And after doing certain derivations, the, the steady state equations would be subjected to a Gauss-Seidel methodology or calibration or a simulation that would allow us to solve the overlapping generations model and analyze the path of steady state and analyze the significant policy changes that will happen given the implementation of a new tax regime. And to calibrate the values, we actually used parameter values that are specific to the Philippines. If another country would be implementing the same model, another set of parameter values can be used in order to simulate the path of different macroeconomic and microeconomic variables depending on the context, on the local context of the economy, implementing the same methodology. 
Now, I would just like to proceed with the key findings of this overlapping generations model. Number one is that with a brain drain tax, it did not profoundly alter, in the Philippine context, it did not profoundly alter the path of steady state current consumption of the migrant worker. However, future consumption exhibited a significant decline. Okay? And this is because the model has incorporated habit formation. And one possible explanation could be the loss of purchasing power arising from the tax caused distortions on current and future consumption. Okay? Second, the decline in current and future consumption allowed for a higher path of steady state aggregate output and steady state capital stock. At the expense of consumption, we have an increase in aggregate income and consumption. Okay? And as the imposition of the brain drain tax happened, as the new fiscal policy is implemented, it actually placed the economy at a higher position, but again at the expense of current and future consumption. And to illustrate this one, this has been the trend, no? the trend of steady, the path of the steady state current, future consumption, steady state capital, and aggregate income. And it's very obvious from the, from the graphs that the decline in consumption facilitated an increase in aggregate output and capital stock in the long run. And some conclusions, that's what I have mentioned, that the profundity of temporary labor migration in the Philippines as manifested by the deployment level of migrant workers in the Philippines va of varying skill level. But again, this study only focused on skilled migrant workers. And accompanied by a huge volume of remittances the economy receives, it contributes to economic stabilization. Yeah. Remittances has been demonstrating a cyclical pattern as far as the Philippine economy is concerned. And again, uh, despite the pandemic, as we move towards a post-pandemic period, the persistence of brain drain issue has become more emphasized no? because of the lack of replacement and the social costs of labor migration that somebody has to internalize. And conclusions would be, we can revisit the imposition of a brain drain tax and how it can impact consumption capital accumulation, and aggregate output or income. In developing a theoretical OLG model representing the Philippines or any other economy that has temporary labor migration as well, okay, selected parameter values are very important so that we can approximate closer the actual scenario in the domestic economy. Okay. And the results of our work Simulation has actually highlighted two key findings. Number one is that taxation is indeed a redistribution tool that can benefit the macroeconomy. Second, taxation creates opportunity costs no, in welfare between and across generation because of the change in the current and future consumption. And recommendations for future research, no, there's a need, no, as just like any other theoretical model, there is a need to further augment any theoretical model, to introduce other complexities. I, I started with a very basic OLG model and introducing complexities that are, sig that are specific to your economy is critical. Okay? And we also consider enriching the discussion on the practicality, no? because usually theoretical models are very highfalutin. There's a need to translate it into something that is more consumable for the policymakers and the general public, of course. And there's also a need to probe on the predicament of social planners in weighing the welfare of the households and the welfare of the macroeconomy. And on that note, thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We have 15 minutes left, so if you have questions for Seydou, Katya, Vincent, or John Paolo. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> Fish. Then, <coughs> sorry, it's your turn. Yeah. Well, I'm supposed to be the discussant. I, I don't think it's the thing, but I was told three days ago. So I haven't read your paper, but uh, there is no paper, right? But I've read the others. In fact, I, <laughs> I read yours first a long time ago when you felt so good. Uh, so, yeah. So the first paper, I missed the first bit, but I did read the paper. Uh, I think it's very valuable. Uh, but, but, but,
particularly because you have tried to explain uh, the political economy question of the legitimacy of a corporate tax uh, as being OECD driven. But what you have not done is link that to your empirical results, which I think you should do. So the interesting next step there would be, I think, to ask whether if you had a UN mandated tax reform, the effects which you quite currently po uh, correctly point out of the, of the tax would be more favorable to developing countries. The two other technical points I have on yours are basically to do with theory. To what extent would it be the case that the negative effects you're seeing or the negligible effects you're seeing in Africa are base effects, so to speak, simply because the level of formalization in Africa is low, GDP levels are low, and therefore perhaps you know, you're not getting the kind of payback you would from a minimum corporate tax. So there would be a certain scale of economy. And the only way you can do that is to go outside Africa, possibly look at an emerging economy, or look at South Africa specifically, where you do have scale and see what happens there uh, in incorporating them. Otherwise, it's a great paper. I think it's very, very useful. Uh, oh, in passing, uh, one of the policy options that countries do have is to have an NCT, but to also impose a dividend distribution tax, right? At, uh, or the equivalent of that if the money is being transferred, which segues nicely into your paper, Katya, on PEPs, which was, I think, very sound. Uh, again, to theorize it, what is the underlying theoretical assumption here that uh, PEPS reform is intended to do what exactly? Is it intended to prevent tax receipts that should come to an, a country because the activities that generate that tax happen in that country? Or is it to try and make sure that countries do not arbitrage between jurisdictions? So if you specified that, I think, at the beginning, that you're trying to look at it, I think you're trying to look at the first. You're not so interested in the second. I could be wrong. But that is, that is well worth looking at. Uh, and I think to complete this research, you need a panel, because you're, you're stuck with this annual data. It's going to be coming out once a year, so I sympathize with that. But I wouldn't draw too many conclusions from the paper based on the limited number of years you have. So I would, I would highlight that caution and try and look for a panel, or do what the third paper did, which is if you can get the funding, and do some primary research to corroborate the in-year in results of this uh, phenomenon. Because the BEPS phenomenon is an in-year phenomenon, right? It's not beginning and end, but you're not able to capture that because there's no data. So perhaps a small primary exercise would help. The third paper is completely bizarre. I mean, I loved it because it's so interesting. It's completely counterintuitive, right? I've lived in Brazil and I've worked there, and the lottery works there, you're right. So uh, why? What would be the theoretical reason why people would not respond to the lottery as an incentive? Uh, perhaps we could have spent a little more time on that. So I'd say one reason why people may not have uh, responded, they have information, but firms are able to game them, is because the net expected gain, in theory, from winning the lottery is probably less than the real loss in price that comes from asking for a receipt. By which I mean, it's a question, did you check like used to happen to me in New York all the time that I lived there, right? Louis, I don't know if you had this. You went to a shop and they said, okay, if you don't want a receipt, we'll split the VAT. You know, you keep 5%, I keep 5%. That happens in India all the time. So is there some profit splitting going on at the expense of, of the tax authority which disincentivizes people from entering into the lottery game? Uh, that would explain, you know, theoretically, again, that would explain why knowledge of the lottery is th there why receipt take-up is there, but there is sort of a certain complicity which limits the effectiveness of it for tax increase purposes. But very interesting paper. I mean, I was quite like a suspense movie. I was quite shocked by the result, <laughs> frankly. Okay, the final paper, of course, is very interesting. Uh, this, uh, since I primarily work in theory, I have more comments on this than any, other, any of the others. But, uh, uh, okay, so, you chose an ORG, and I'm, you know, and, and as far as you've done, the, the paper is quite impeccable with an ORG style analysis. But why would you choose an OLD model as your research strategy if you want to analyze the macro impact of evidences? So the way I would look at it is, I wish there was, is there chalk there? Uh, no, 
okay, I'll try and do this verbally. So if you think about the, the equations, I would write the macro equations. The first would be sort of the opportunity cost of someone not emigrating is the domestic income they earn, right? So you do sigma WD. And that, I mean, if, if, if the person is rational, and well, <coughs> need not be rational. I mean, many Indians emigrate for social reasons to escape the caste system. And they actually earn less when they emigrate than they would have in their home country. That happens, but assuming that is not the case in the Philippines, and the motivation is economic, so you have WD there, that is total wa you know, expected wage income across the lifetime and in a time period. And on the other side, you would have minus imports, because it's macro, right? So whatever wages they are spending on imports must be reduced so that the total impact of earning a certain wage stays within the GDP consumption investment cycle. On the right-hand side, that would be less than, hopefully, uh, the wage earned internationally, right? Minus the consumption internationally. So that difference is the payoff from emigration. And you equalize that difference by adding a plus T, the brain gain tax, right? So it would be possible in that model to sort of simulate different kinds of, different values of T, which again allow for the benefits of migration to be distributed and equalized. So that was the first point I had. I was curious why, you know, that, that's a benefit you would get maybe as a supplementary paper when you did this. On the other side, your findings can be explained macroeconomically in the following way, very simply. So your uh, disposable income in a country is Y minus T, right? And Y is equal to delta C plus delta S, okay? Uh, so minus T must come either through reduction in consumption or reduction in investment. Now in any ONG model, you will, have, you will get that life cycle where initially you will reduce consumption because the tax is paid now, and, but you will not reduce your long-term investment. So you would tend to wait uh, the payment of a tax in choosing to consume an invest, but you did not have investment by the household or savings by the household in your uh, model. I was wondering, that would be an interesting thing to do when you, when you expand on it. Uh, otherwise, great paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. We still have a few minutes for uh, to take a few questions if there are any. Please, go ahead. I'll give you the microphone for people who are connected. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Riyatu from Indonesia. Hello. Uh, I like to know: is actually the papers, uh, your papers, uh, you are discussing about the globe global minimum tax? Uh, I don't know. This is the stupid question. Uh, but the empirical is on the corporate uh, income tax uh, collection revenue per country, and the tax rate that you are uh, addressing. So it is more on the tax rate impact rather than uh, because the globe uh, rather than uh, actually uh, the global minimum tax is on multinational firms. So I thought it is should be on the firm level uh, rather than I don't know how it actually can be used uh, or or use uh, the aggregate data. But I would like to know about that and. Uh, on the uh, Paulo or Rivera <laughs> or John? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Rivera, I, I think uh, it's quite interesting on the uh, Redditon uh, tax. Uh, I don't know, the Philippine is territorial uh, tax, right? Uh, and the characteristic of your, uh, I don't know, maybe similar to the US and do you it means also it will be a move to World income taxation, or I don't know, that your model of the brain uh, brain tax. I don't know about that. And uh, on the VAT, uh, is it is it also like the receipt, the consumer that consumer doesn't really know, right? Whether like the sellers is actually paying the paying the tax, what they, I mean. The price is included the tax, but even if they receive the tax, they they really don't know whether whether the firms of the or the sellers uh, paying it to the tax or authority. So, uh, given that in the developing countries is many, uh, even not uh, the tax authority doesn't know like the financial report of the firms, how could 
I don't know how could this actually uh, really correlate to to that tax collection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other question? Please. Yeah, my name is Sabine from the um, German Institute of uh, Development and Sustainability, and I have a comment or question to Katja's paper. And um, yeah, first I agree with the discussion. It would be great if you get panel data, I think, to uh, really evaluate the form of the transfer pricing reform, because I also do it in my PhD studies. Uh, I evaluate transfer pricing reforms, and what I found is that there are some fading out effects also sometimes and th that would be better than, than cross-sections. And also, um, do you a question, do you know more about the firm's ownership structures? Do these firms in their treatment group really have affiliates in um, low-tax countries? So do they really engage in profit shifting? And um, for example, one database I can hint to I'm using is the Orbis database, but I don't know how well Peru is covered, or maybe if you have connections, you can get administrative data from the Peru tax administrations. I think that could be really nice. Um, and another thing is, I think I would also look at other dependent variables. You look at tax payments, maybe the effective tax rate is interesting, so dividing tax payments by pre-tax profits, and also pre-tax profits could be an interesting variable to look at, and also maybe then the real investment effects, like looking at fixed assets of the companies, are, are there really also real investment effects? Are the, are the companies changing their investment behavior after this um, more detailed transfer pricing documentation reform? Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have f five minutes. We'll go to the uh, authors again, but uh, now in reverse order. So we'll start with you, uh, Jean Paolo. Okay, hello. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And I must agree that the tax system in the Philippines is loosely based on the United States. The, different, the difference is, instead of implementing a citizen-based taxation in the Philippines, wherein everyone gets taxed regardless of where they are working, the Philippines has actually instituted a taxation system wherein migrant workers are actually levied 0% tax because they are already bringing in remittances for the local economy. But then because of the constraints, no, the budgetary constraints that we are experiencing right now, government is really looking for a lot of novel and different ways in order to generate tax revenues. That's why the discussion has, has been directed toward, towards this. But yeah, the, the tax system is based on the US, but then the local economy has been trying to find ways, creative ways, in order to minimize or mitigate the impacts of this tax on the consumer welfare because Filipinos are very high on consumption. The economy is driven by, yes, tourism, remittances, and also consumption. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you for the questions. So yeah, I'll try to answer quickly. So one question was about the, the rent sharing between the, the customers and the businesses. So like anecdotal evidence uh, shows that this is clearly happening. I, ha I, don't, I don't know of any quantitative evidence of how big is this phenomenon. No, we thought that wouldn't be, this is one of the reasons we the lottery wa was designed as it is, where every ticket is one chance of winning, independently of the amount. So the idea is that you can still say you buy something for 10,000, you give 9,000 in cash under the table, 1,000 on the receipt, and you have a chance to win the lottery. So we thought that designing it like that, we, should, we could still see an effect on the printing of receipts, even if uh, businesses and customers somehow share the rent of uh, evading the, the VAT. The other reason, I'm not sure it's, uh, it's an issue in all cases, is that we're also looking at those non-registered businesses that is businesses that have to print a receipt, but there is no VAT. So in that case, there is no, nothing to negotiate. Uh, so and, and also among them, we don't see an effect. So what I really think is happening is that the customers did react. 
the, the, you know, the, the proportion of customers who ask for receipt goes up by 10 percentage points within three months. But then the proportion of the businesses reacted against that, the proportion of businesses who give a receipt without being asked one goes down by 10 percentage points as well. And as a whole, those two things compensate and nothing changes. But then uh, the other question was about the like expected utility. Is it that I'm not sure. I mean, we know that expected utility theory is, is bad at, at explaining people's behavior in terms of, of lottery. Like no, no one should pay the lottery if, if they're expected, you know, if they're maximizing expected utility, but every, everybody plays the lottery. So, I mean, I don't have direct evidence, but I, 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 I'm not sure that's a, that's a reason why people don't ask for receipt, but it's, it's difficult to prove. Um, finally, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question, but I'm happy to discuss it uh, after the session. Thank you, Katia. Thank you for the question and the comments. First, mm, yes, indeed, uh, would be great to be able to use panel data. Uh, at this point, uh, we are not able to do that, but mainly because the source of our uh, database, but we will uh, look for to, to do it. And about the ownership uh, structure of the firms, Yes, in the, um, in the survey that we use, uh, there is a section of ownership, and we have, uh, we, we, uh, we have seen that the most of the reported, uh, reported firms and under the survey uh, are subsidiaries with headquarters mainly in US and uh, in, in other LAC countries which are which has like a more I, I economic economic more the dynamic i mean brazil uh, and chile so given that the headquarters reported are uh, in most of cases are us first and given that we know uh, for previous research that U.S. headquarters are the most aggressive uh, in terms of profit shifting. Yes, I would say that um, for us, there are some evidence that, uh, that channels to uh, channels that can facilitate profit shifting mechanisms uh, exist in in this in this are in in. Um, um, okay, uh, and uh, uh, finally, about uh, regarding the other outcomes, uh, yes, n uh, currently we are trying to commute, to, to calculate the effect on uh, ETR. So we are, um, we wanted like uh, to include more, more outcomes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seydou. Thank you very much. Let me let me start thanking the, the colleague for for the comment you you raised. Actually, the the idea of uh, you know look uh, t taking taking a look at of introducing a domestic tax is a good one. Uh, uh, actually, what the expert are, are suggesting is that to to thinking about introducing what they call the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax, such that you erase any opportunity for other countries to charge a top-up tax. That's a very good idea that, uh, that is well noted. And uh, you also suggest uh, uh, undertaking, you know, country analysis for South Africa. That's something that, that, that's very, very, very good. And uh, I, I, will, I will also look at that. Now, go Let's uh, go back to, to, to the question that you raised about aggregate data to, to analyze the uh, revenue effect of, of global minimum tax that is actually targeting uh, multinational enterprises. That's a very good idea and observation. But the issue is, if you take Africa, you don't have you know multinational enterprises data for many countries over a long period. So there is a issue of availability of data, and uh, the only, you know, only one data that uh, data set that we know is from Orbis, you know, but which is not free. 
and the, the issue of Orbis data is that it's, it's about financial statement, right? It's not about tax return, but the yeah, focus should be most on tax return. So what um, what I'm thinking to do, and I try, I, I start working on that, is to to collect data f from you know individual tax administration from Africa to to look at what we can do or by country by country basis and uh, but the good news is that in Africa if you look at the the proportion of corporate tax revenue from multinational it's very high it's very high that means that the bias by using aggregate data I I is 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 small okay that that the, the good news from from that perspective but for Togo I have started collecting data from multinationals and uh, based on their tax return, tax payment data, and we will be uh, able to, to do the analysis, but it will not be for panel data, just for, for one country. That's what I can, I can say uh, uh, for on, your, on your question, and I thank you for, for that observation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the authors for a very good session, and thank you to all of you for attending. So we'll close with an applause to the authors.